every morning about three. Yeah. They go out about every three and three o'clock in the morning, and uh, they just don't have any problem running off the game. That's really remarkable. So, and you you were telling me that, that those guys are running, was it six or seven packs a day? Yes, sir. Oh. Yeah, they have a huntsman for each pack. Uh, out of the headquarters there at Richards, they run three packs. They run two that have dedicated areas, farms or ranches that they patrol. And then they have one pack that's kind of their call-out pack. If they have uh, a farmer way off somewhere who may not be a, a member of their little uh, a co-op uh, that's having an issue, well, they'll send Enoch and his pack. And then if he doesn't have a call-out, uh, he's training young dogs, and he'll go to the different areas. And we'll go with some of the other huntsmen. Uh, uh, that are located at some of the other farms in the cooperative that are 30 or 40 miles away. He'll go with some of them during the week so he can evaluate their hounds as well. Sure. But, sure. Uh, yeah, that's what they're running, about seven packs, six dedicated packs, and then the uh, the call-out pack. Right. And he's came a long way. I mean, in the last figure, how long have we been working together on some of that, Carrie? Like, Seven years, eight years? Seven years. Yes, yeah, seven years. Yes, sir. Yeah, he's came a long way as far as building that pack. I, I love getting oh, the yeah. pictures. Those cats and jackals are, are so cool to see. Yep. Well, Trevor's back, you know, the whatever country, I think it's Botswana, they've opened leopard hunting back up with hounds. And so that's what Trevor, you know, is doing. Uh they're doing some safaris up there for some outfitters, mm -hmm. some safari yeah. operators uh, for Leopard. And, and again, they've been pleasantly surprised uh, that the walkers, uh, the way they're handling the Leopard, you said, you know, they, they trail like bloodhounds and they, they, the tracks are usually in dry country where they drive the roads and they find a big track with a big mail and put the hounds on, they don't know whether he's been gone an hour or two days, but he's like a lion over here in the States, hmm. leaves lots of scent. Uh, their pot liquor kind of dogs would take forever and might work hard all day and never get the cat jump, but their walkers are, with the style, the way they advance a track and the leapfrogging and, and the fast way they move a track, you know, they're getting the leopards up and either putting them in the rocks or up a tree, you know, in a in a very short period of time. Right. And, and having lots of success. And the good news is when, when a leopard, and they'll have a few, just like you'll have a few lions, won't tree. Uh, when they're bait on the ground, the walkers handle them more like a border collie. They just, they kind of keep him circling. And, uh, they're not getting dogs killed with their old style dogs. When that leopard stayed on the ground, they had to go find more dogs. Yeah. And right. They, they would run out. Right. There, uh, one of, uh, Jason, you'll have to remind me who it was, but one of the, one of the Bruce Kennedy interviews was with a guy who said he went down to, he, he went down to South America and was hunting those jaguars. Yeah, you know, I may be wrong on this, but I want to say it was C.J. Prof. That's who it was. Um, That's exactly Yeah, it, it was yeah. one of the Warriors of Algato series. Yeah. Uh, Brett he, does. he went down there with 42 dogs, and after two weeks he had two left. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was a rough trip. <laughs> so yeah. I, I want to back up a little, Kerry, because you, you – referred to a dog as a pot liquor. Um, and a lot of people think that is a derogatory term, but what, what is the definition of a pot liquor? Well, a uh, more of the, the coon dog style dog, uh, would probably be more of a trailing style dog. Uh, you know, a dog that's bred here in the States that really for coon hunting, uh, mm -hmm. and a coon is an animal that, you know, leaves a lot of scent, doesn't travel real far. Uh, you know, that 
uh, a trailing type dog can handle quite well. And in right. certain areas, uh, you know, in the in the snow, uh, you know, they they work pretty well on on bobcats some too. But uh, yeah, you know, they they certainly have yeah. a a niche in in certain areas they certainly do totally different track style yeah yeah uh, that's interesting how you know when i when, when i think about running walkers versus you know a, a, a treeing walker you know i i, I kind of think that one one's going to be better for foxes one's going to be better for you know treeing game coons, that's what, cats. yeah that's what they were bred for yeah Right, but your your guys are they're really solid on things that tree like you know like the jaguars are going to tree the uh, the um, well, bobcats tree here there. in the states. Yeah, our bobcats tree here in the states in some areas, especially areas that where the coyote populations have gone up. If a, if a bobcat's going to live where there's a high density population of coyotes he better know how to climb a tree <laughs> and uh uh you know jason knows we we've, we've chuckled for years with people on big game houndsmen uh talking about well running dogs can't tree uh jason knows he's talked to enough people down here that you know not just our stock of dogs but uh running walker dogs across the southeast georgia the carolinas mississippi alabama uh, fox dogs, a gray fox will climb a tree. So yep. there are a lot of running dogs that will tree. Not just our line of dogs, but uh, most every one of the dogs we refer to as the clay, clay hounds, they, they're going to tree. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me because I, I was so hesitant to get into the running dogs, quote unquote, um, because I was a blue tick guy. Uh, I mean, hey, you take them to the woods and they they can tree it, you know, 12 weeks old. I, I, you know, they'll follow a track. It was easy to see a result, like as a young guy starting out. Um, and I was just really hesitant to make that switch. But I will tell you this, when I made the switch over to the running dogs, not just treeing, but the accuracy involved. I mean, we went from having tree dogs to having locate dogs, even though it took them, let's say, a year and a half to tree, you know, I had one that even took longer than that. It was, it was almost two years before she treated, but I have never been to a slick with her either, you know, and that yep. to me is worth its weight in gold when you're hunting rough country. You bet you that's nothing more frustrating than the climb two or three mountains to get to a tree and it's, it's empty or, or down here where we are weighed chest deep water through a swamp and, you know, poking alligators out of your way and uh, <laughs> get to a tree and, and there's nothing there uh, but some dumb looking dogs uh, <laughs> that uh, that makes you want <clears throat> to remove some from the gene pool pretty quick but something we find with these running dogs when they tree they're so accurate takes them longer to locate uh, might take 20 minutes they don't just stop at the end of the track and sit down and go to slobber mouth tree and takes them a minute first they're checking to make sure the varmint hadn't slipped out on them then they're they're moving around and locating where they're getting the scent directly from the varmint and now we don't have trees as big as jason has on the uh, west coast of, out of the united states but now we've got some 120 150 foot tall pine trees and, and big palm trees down in Florida. I'll be up there 120, 30, 40 foot tall. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, when a dog trees down here, one of these running dog trees, he's actually getting the scent directly from the varmint. And, uh, you know, they're not standing at the base of the tree. They're off out there 30, 40 feet looking up. And where, if you'll follow that line of sight from their eyes and where their nose is pointing, Generally, that's where you go find the varmint. That's where he is. That's my favorite part, I think, because when I first started, we used to have some dogs that would sit down and tree. You know, I'm not personally, I would rather have a dog sit back and tree than be up there jacking it. You know, that just seems to be 
where you run into problems, tree fights, and, yeah. you know, any yeah. kind of disgruntled dog, you're going to amplify that if you got someone jacking the tree. But that's the cool thing to me is those dogs that you can look at and you know they're looking at the game. It can be pitch black and you're looking at that dog and you know he's looking right at the game. Right. And that's I, one thing I really like about the running dogs is they're just so methodical about it. And they, like Carrie said, John, sorry. I never know what to call you, John. <laughs> Carrie, Carrie, John, just don't forget to call me when the groceries are ready to eat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. We, yeah. I'd love to get you out here. It's been how long has it been since you've been to Oregon? About four oh, years, five years. Yeah, four years, four years. Yeah, yeah. He's been out here and yeah. seen the country. He was kind of in the heart of that thick coastal range, godforsaken country. Yeah, old JC took me over there, down there, back towards uh, Mike Kemp country from Myrtle Point, uh, up in some rough, rough old country. And, yep. uh, yeah, that was, and it was heel up and heel down because I went with him to a tree and tree wasn't, but about 40 yards down below the truck. Uh, <laughs> How long did it take you? But, yeah. Oh, well, it didn't take long to get down to the tree, but now coming back up, I thought he's going to have to call to town to send a wrecker out with a winch truck to get me back up the hill. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, mm, yeah, that was a little rough. <laughs> it's, rough. it's rough country out there it's rough country out there i spent a little bit of time in washington and it, it's it, uh... it, and you know something that we find with the running dogs uh and there's lots of thick bad country out in oregon they've got some of those wild roses and rhododendrons and uh thick bad here we've got the bad briars mm. uh blackberry bar, uh, briars that are really terrible in, in South Africa. They've got lots of issues. You know, the running walker dogs, uh, just a little tougher. They, you can repeat, you know, I'm not going to say that some of the tree dog stocks of dogs won't go through that kind of country, but they don't really want to. And if you hammer them hard, uh, two or three days, a couple of days in a row, if you can get them to go, uh, they're, uh, they're hesitant to go back until they get rested and kind of forget about it. Well, the, the running dogs, you can repeat them day after day. Uh, you know, we get them, we run them down here and they get, you'll have to stop them, lay them up because they just wear the hide out from between their front legs. Yeah. It just gets raw with these briars, but they, I won't say have more guts, but, uh, you know, when you talk to, Richard, he tells you that, you know, he can repeat dogs day after day after day where they couldn't before. It's just a, just a little more stamina in the running dogs. And some of it may be, and Jason, you can chime in on this. Some of it's the fact that generally our running dogs have better, better skeletal structure. They just have a better set of running gear on. And uh, that is an interesting observation, you know, because as I said to you a little earlier before we started recording here is, you know, my background is in, is in a long distance Alaskan Huskies. <laughs> right. And those dogs, they need to be 100% sound to be able to do those kind of distances. You know, we're talking about 100 plus miles a day yep. for eight, nine days in a row. And the hounds that I've seen here, the only hound that I have seen so far that would be able to just slide right into that team of mine is this running walker female. She is physically 100% sound. Everything is exactly proportioned the way that it should be to be able to do what I'm asking her to do day after day after day after day. Whereas, you know, I, uh, you know, I've got a couple of other dogs and, and, you know, I, they've, they've got their own strengths and their own qualities, but, you know, physically they're going to break before she does. Yeah. They're not built. I think that's, I mean, I'm probably going to really irritate some people with this statement, but form follows function. 
you know, dog locomotion is something that is so under, it's underappreciated by people or, or they just don't know, you know, they hear what's going on. They can see what a dog's doing, but 90% of a dog is what we don't see. And it's that longevity, the gas tank, you know, and to me, you look at a lot of these, uh, we'll say the coonhound breeds. I think back to when we were showing, God, it's probably been five years since I've had a dog in the show ring because I got so fed up with things and everybody, it's like we're over accentuating certain features of a dog that literally have nothing to do with the hunt. You know, yes, head structure is important. Um, but, you know, to me, I'm looking more at how's a dog put together? Do, do they have the reach? Do they have the drive? And even the country, it changes, like for Carrie and, and you, Bear, like you guys are hunting different country. I'm hunting different country. I like a little bit square dog because I'm hunting steep country. And it seems like they can get through it better. Where if you get that kind of dog that's long in the back, they just, don't seem to handle the the mountains as well but when you get them on the flat ground man they can stretch out flat put it to them but i think that the structure of a dog is something i would really encourage people you know research it a little bit there's all kinds of stuff out there and it's not just in hunting dogs it's in the huskies in any kind of working dog the frame and the structure is your one limitation i feel that you can't improve on you can make a dog work harder on a cold track, you know, by forcing them to do it sometimes, or you can help them rig better. You can't improve angles. You can't improve joint structure. That's something that I see both in the hound world and do- and in the uh, the Alaskan Husky world is that people are breeding men, you know, they're breeding mentally tougher and tougher dogs. Dogs right. have less and less of that ability to to just to switch it off you know to preserve their own health preserve themselves and you know when that goes hand in hand with a perfectly proportioned dog that that can work you know you can have a dog that can go and and not have any problems but when you're just breeding for that mental aspect and not paying attention to the fact that you've got a dog whose head weighs 40 percent of its overall body weight that dog's gonna bust down on its that that dog's gonna bust down its front end and you're breeding a dog that is going to willfully and happily destroy itself. Yeah, they're done by four or five years old. They're exactly. running like a 10 year old. Yep, exactly. And I, you know, I, it's, I've gotten some, I've gotten some criticism for it over here where I will not criticize a dog, but say that, you know, turn down a, I've turned down a couple of pretty good dogs because I just have not liked how they've been put together. That's you're making the smart move though, in my opinion, because why are you going to dump it in, you know, the time, the energy involved to have a prospect that you're going to have in peak hunting condition for two years, three years, you know, that's the hard part. If you ever introduce something like that into your strain of dogs, then always remember it takes seven generations to get rid of it. Yeah. It's very easy to, to put, um, uh, you know, if there's a dog, a, a glamor girl or, a uh, somebody that, that just has got one trait that you just really, really think you need to, to interject into your line of dogs, whether they're, they're working dogs or whether they're hunting hounds, uh, and you don't look at the, that dog and that hound in its entirety, mm. uh, you, you can do long-term problems to your program. Uh, because if you, if you put a weakness in, it takes seven generations to get rid of it. And that's a long yeah. time for an old fat man like me. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're talking about that, I just wanted to, now that we're talking a little bit about genetics, can you give us a little bit of a rundown? Give us a little bit of the history of the Clayhound and, uh, you know, what, what you and, and before you, your father, uh, what you were trying to accomplish and, 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 and what you have accomplished. Well, going back <clears throat> to my dad, uh, starting with his cat dogs in the late 1950s, back where we lived at the time in central Texas, 
a lot of gray fox hunters. And Daddy could go get really good gray fox dogs and make bobcat dogs. Had the same skill sets. But long about the early 60s, middle 60s, uh, the coyotes had moved into our part of the world. And those gray fox hunters, they were losing their gray fox. The coyotes were killing them out. Uh, and it was just easier to go run a coyote. So they were acquiring dogs with different skill sets that didn't work as well for a, for a bobcat hound. A bobcat leaves very little scent. Need to have a dog that's got a good nose and a dog that's got the brains to know how to use it. Has to have the running gear to be able to get that nose and the brains to the right point at the right time. So Daddy had known a Mr. Hinkle Shillings mm-hmm. And been real familiar with his dogs over in far east Texas. And a dog called uh, Mark S., uh, who was a line bred dog. Uh, he was a line bred going back to a dog from the uh, early 1900s, old hound called Hub Dawson, who was an outstanding gray fox, red fox hound. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and his hounds, his offspring were proficient on both of them. Well, anyway, brings us to old uh, Mark S. Daddy had the chance to get a hold of a of a bitch. Some some boys there in in our area had who was line bred Mark S. Some uh, two brothers over at Hemp Hill, Texas, uh, had raised this this female. So daddy leased her and uh, had he went and bought a double-bred Marquess son. He was an own son of Marquess, bred back to a Marquess daughter. Mm-hmm. And then bred, bred the bitch that he leased, who the Monroe brothers had, had bred. She had Marquess three times in her three-generation pedigree. Is that right? So... So he, he mated those two and got eight hounds, eight puppies. And uh, you could throw a blanket over them. They all had the uh, very desirable traits put together. Uh, could have been very, very good on bench shows, but they were very biddable. They wanted to please you. Uh, a, a great then they were a pack, had eight of them. He raised all eight, and they were, uh, boy, it, it just kind of revolutionized. Daddy always had good dogs, and he was catching 300 bobcats a year before he started breeding those dogs. But when those dogs reached two years old, uh, they were a pack of themselves, and they didn't need any help. So then he starts, uh, he took the best bitch out of that pack and took her to Florida and bred her to a Mark S, double bred Mark S dog that was uh, uh, down in Florida at the time and uh, went with his breeding program. That's how he initiated his breeding program. He could breed dogs that he had all the skill sets that he wanted you couldn't buy them anymore. Right. Cause he wanted to be, he, he wanted to hunt. He still was hunting Fox and, and Bob, or he, or sorry, he was hunting Bobcat. Yeah. 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 Bobcat alone. And, uh, and they just presented the right skill set. So then over the years, uh, you know, he line bred within his own pack and then he would, uh, there were some other people, over in the Virginias that had Marquess dogs uh, had had sons and daughters of Marquess that they uh, uh, had. So he would go, he bought a, a female from Mr. Ed Corker, and then uh, he bred to some, uh, a male dog come from Mr. Uh, Clifford Clark. And then Mr. Mel Clark uh, was a gray fox hunter, retired professional baseball player, in uh, West Virginia, who was a gray fox hunter, uh, he line bred as close as daddy. You know, he bred uh, 
aunts to nephews and uh, nieces to uncles. And then about every third generation, he'd bring a son back to the mother or a father to the uh, daughter uh, to tighten up on, on one specific trait that he was wanting to emphasize. And uh, he said that was always a good way. Uh, he was a, a really good lay geneticist. Uh, yeah. You know, not college educated in genetics, but had a very practical knowledge of breeding and genetics. And uh, uh, Mr. Mel Clark said, if you would do that about every third generation, you'd uh, you'd make those recessive, those negative recessive traits come forth, and you could remove them from the gene pool, and uh, you know, then you just didn't have to. And after seven generations. If, if you have a uh, an undesirable trait come up, usually that's that's a uh, uh, a case where it, uh, genetic morphing uh, more than uh, recessive traits okay. is what you would tend to have. But anyway, that that was how Daddy was able to. Uh, have the genetic consistency. You know, Daddy always felt like it was a waste of time to, uh, and he had played the game of breeding the best of the best. He'd have a good bitch in his pen, and he'd, he'd, he'd holler, drive four or 500 miles to breed her to an outstanding male dog that had no genetic compatibility or continuity to each other, yep. and raise eight or 10 puppies and Maybe one of them was worth feeding. The rest of them, you know, were just dogs. Where yeah. Yeah. once Daddy saw that, you know, by breeding and paying attention to your genetics, that first pack of dogs, those first eight puppies, all made outstanding dogs. That if you follow your genetics, uh and get your genetic consistency, it's just a more efficient way to raise good hounds. Thoroughbred horse people have been doing that for a couple of thousand years. Sure. Were you, did he, was he into hounds before you were born? Were you born into, were you oh, born into the hounds? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, born into it. But yeah, daddy, daddy had hounds uh, going back into the, uh, you know, the forties, he started off with hounds when he was five or six, seven years old. He had an old black gentleman that worked for the family would take him, uh, take him to the woods, you know, prior to world war two, they were, uh, you know, the old black gentleman was, you know, they, they hunted for fur. They hunted for fur and meat, you know, they ate the possums and coons and yep. sold the fur. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. I, I gotta say, I mean, with the line breeding, because that's the big topic that always seems to come up. Best to best, or is there a logic behind it? And I think everybody has a different level at which they gauge a dog. You know, they're looking at different things. Is that the best dog because it's it's caught more game, or it's a better rig dog, or this or that? Everybody has their own criteria. But if you're looking at producing a consistent line of dogs, and not just slapping your name on it, you know, a, a true yep. line of dogs. Eat. I don't see any way that you can do it without that line. You, you have to have a consistency there so that even if you do have to outcross, which, you know, I'm assuming a lot of people do anyway, but you have one kind of stable factor. You have that line breeding behind it and consistency instead of just hoping and praying for the best where you get, let's say two good dogs out of a litter of 10. I don't consider yeah. that a successful litter personally. No. And, and, you know, we fight this battle all the time. Richard in South Africa has become a disciple, but now twice a year, I'll get this phone call. Mr. Clay, what do you think about breeding to this so-and-so dog? So-and-so's got somewhere that's uh, English Fox sound, something cross. Well, what what does he have that you don't have in your dogs? Well, Mr. Clay, they're telling me that we're bleeding, breeding these hounds too close. I said, oh, really? 
you know, here's that euphemistic they again. You know, they know a whole lot, but yet they haven't done anything. The euphemistic they. I said, mm-hmm. Richard, yeah, I sent you, I sent him a, a, a red ring that bitch called, named Cody. Cody was a product of a brother sister mating who her sire and dam were a half brother, half sister mating. And when I sent her down there, I said, now the first mating, you breed her back to her brother that I sent you and identify the top male and top female in that litter and, and pull them out of your hunting packs and put them up in your, uh, for your stud program. Yeah. And that's, and they really, I mean, Richard really has bought in and he has developed uh, some outstanding hounds. And with that euphemistic, they, go to finding out about how tight they're bred, uh, people just panic. Oh, no, you're going to get in trouble. Well, he hadn't yet, and he's, you know, eight years into it, you know, and about 200 hounds into it, and he's got people from all over that part of the world trying to buy hounds from him. Uh, he's over there in Africa, is that correct? Yeah, right. South Africa. And he, yeah, the Eastern Cape in South Africa, it's a, a lot of small stock farms over there. And, hmm. uh, you know, they're working. They're not just doing it for pleasure. They're doing it to uh, preserve some people's livelihoods. You know, uh, I know here a couple of years ago, uh, they caught a, a, a pair of jackals that he killed five male uh little male goats the night before that were $1,500, $2,000 a piece, wow. you know, kids for that rancher, you know, they had, had hit that farm, hurt them that bad. And, uh, they were able to take the hounds in there. And, the, and these were, were smart critters that other people had taken hounds in and not been able to catch them. They hadn't been able to trap them. And uh, Richard told the farmer, he said, you know, make sure all your traps are picked up. Next time you have an issue, call me and I'll send Enoch. And uh, they did. And uh, they struck him off the rig, coming out of the field where they had killed the five little goats. Didn't eat them, just killed them for sport. And uh, they struck him off the rig. They ran and killed the male. <coughs> Old Bear came right back. He didn't go to the huntsman. He came right back to where they struck and left there trailing the female. And then the hounds went to him. They jumped and caught her. Wow. Got both of them. There was a farmer very, very happy. I'll bet. I'll bet that guy was happy. With with the jackals, I'm, I, 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 at some point, I would really love to get um, – to get Richard and Trevor on, on the podcast. I've asked them and I'm, I'm going to, if you guys are listening, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on you guys until you guys agree to do this. But what I'm curious (laughs) about is uh, with the jackals, do you hunt those like you would hunt Fox? Like the, are they going to tree or something like that or go and go to ground? Are they going to be, no, no. Are they going to do like the the, the, type 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 of stuff? Yeah. They're going to run like a red Fox over here in the States. Yeah. Uh, but really yeah. more like a coyote out in the prairies. Yeah. You know, they're, they're going to come do their depredation down along the streams and the pastures where the, the goats and the sheep are, uh, are kept. And then they're going to leave out. And uh, if they're not pressured, they'll lay up in the rocks and the little bluffs and buttes along those uh, uh, water courses. But if you get after them, well, then they want to get up and go out across the uh, the the plains, the old dry plains, and uh, and head to the deep rocks, which is why they run uh, uh, terriers with their packs, so that when they go to ground, the terriers can uh, can can root them out. But yeah. Yeah. you know they'll go. Uh, it's not unusual for them to go after jump to go eight or nine, ten miles. Yeah, and, wow. and not in a circle, straight away. Wow. And they go to the roughest, baddest country they can go to. And and when I say rough, it's not when I rough down here is briars and water. 
down there it's it's rocky dry rocky hillsides and and slopes right wow that's yeah, and those are crazy animals too those jackals are gnarly looking yeah yeah you gotta have a dog that'll pick his head up and and run the scent above ground if a dog is keeping his nose down on the track uh, all he's going to do is follow the jackal around for a day or two. Right, right, right. He's got to be able to pick him. his head up. Yeah, and and the running walker style where they're the leapfrogging, uh, you know, especially in that dry country scent is uh, tough to find. And uh, you got the dogs not single file but spread, you know, 50 to 100 yards wide. And the dog that, that smells him barks and everybody – you know, works that way. Uh, they've got some video shot from drones, and it's sure wonderful to watch and watch the hounds and watch the style in which they work to be so successful. Right. So they they probably value a, a good, I don't want to say tight mouth, but fairly tight, the same way we do over here. You know, if you get a dog that barks out of place and you're pulling dogs that might be trying to leapfrog, That's them, right. all of a yep. sudden you're pulling a whole pack of dogs off a trap. So I would imagine it's really important. Yeah, that's why, you know, it's taken a while, but they don't have many of the tree bred dogs. Uh, they have a lot of crossbred dogs in the pack, half and three quarter running dog, running walker. Uh, but the, uh, the straight tree bred dogs that they have gotten rid of most of those, cause that those dogs would fall back on their breeding where they'd make a lose instead of looking forward to see where the game has gone. They want to go back to where the last place they smelt it and bark. Right. And all that right. does is bring, pull your dogs off. Right. 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 How did um, how did those guys find you the uh, the 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 uh, the African guys Richard and Trevor how just like you did they ought to kiss Buddy and Jason's uh, hand every time they get a chance because big game <laughs> hounds but the internet gotcha okay gotcha yeah because we you and I started talking because I was looking. I've got this running walker female and some right. people probably don't know this. I, I mentioned it to you earlier, but some people probably don't know this, that um, looking at the genetics that are available over here and the genetics of this female, I was kind of looking into what, where she came from and, and, and what she was, you know, what she went back to. And right. three, you know, they, they say all roads lead to Nome. Well, it seems like over here, all running walker genetics lead to Mr. Clay because it, 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 every single dog I have seen over here, every single genetic that I've looked at every, you know, every, every family tree that I've looked at eventually goes back to your stuff, you know, the, the Mark S dog and, and, and dogs, dogs. There you go. And, um, yeah. you know, that's how you and I got, got talking is I wanted to know more about this Mark X, you know, Mark S dog. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly new to this still. And, and, you know, I, I saw this dog again and again and again and again. And I was like, okay, this, this must, this dog must be something here. There's a reason he's in there a lot. There's a reason I'm seeing this dog every, you know, in every single generation. A little background on Mark. Yes. Hmm. Uh, he won the Texas Open in the middle 1950s when he was five years old and was one-eyed. At that time, the Texas Open was the most challenging uh, foxhound field trial uh, in the United States. It was a three-day hunt. Dogs had to run all three days, uh, and they had to run their game. They were hunting outside. They had to go find their game trail it, jump it, and run it, and run it with authority for three days straight. Wow. And uh, Mark S. won it as a five-year-old one-eyed dog. And he won, and when you go back and research it, you'll find it that he won two-thirds of it, uh, or two of the three days, uh, you know, handily. 
and was up in the top three on the whatever day he didn't win it. So uh, he was overpowering. But beyond that, he was what's termed a prepotent sire. Right. And when you bred him, of course, he was only bred to good bitches. Uh, Most all of his puppies were worth feeding, and some were outstanding, really super hounds. He was the top sire of field trial fox dogs in 1960 and 62. And there were lots of people in the Virginias and in Kentucky and in Canada. Uh, fox hunting was a very popular sport uh, for very successful men back at that point in time. And, uh, yeah, old Mark, yes, uh, he made his name, at, but his children enhanced it. And then, you know, people that bred his children the right way were able to perpetrate, the, keep those lines going in perpetuity so that, uh, you know, people like Mr. Mel Clark, and Mr. Clifford Clark, uh, uh, my daddy, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Ed Corker, those kind of people were able to keep those hounds, good hounds going. Sure. Uh, our, our, you know, and I don't know who now, said the, Ed's still alive. Are they still, are they still with us? No, Ed Corker still is, but he's not hunting. He's, he's, uh, you know, retired. He's up in age. He's probably in his late seventies or early eighties. Yep. Mr. Mel Clark's been gone all 10, 12 years. Clifford Clark's been gone 25 years. Okay. Uh, you know, it, and the, the hound game in the States, as Jason will tell you, changed in the 1980s. The foxhound world all went to uh, building pens, you know, and, yeah. and running fox and coyotes inside a high-fenced enclosure that might be as small as 100 acres and as big as 1,200 acres. And uh, inside that, you'd have, you know, 20 or 30 coyotes. And, uh, you know, dogs just didn't have to be smart or be good anymore. They just had to to run a lot and bark a lot, and they'd get high points scored on them. Uh, So that That really changed. That drives me insane. That is something that drives me insane. It's... uh... I went to a couple of over here for the fox hounds over here. And one of the trials I went to was for Russian hounds. Um, one of my dogs is, uh, is, is a Russian, uh, a Russian fox hound. It's a, a breed that they created out of in Russia back in the twenties out of bloodhound Borzoi and something else. I can't, I can't remember what it was. But the, the, what I would have said was the worst dog in the entire group won. Really? Because she, she opened up first. She wasn't on anything, but she waited till the other, she was able to read the other dogs. And when they got Foxy, she opened up. <laughs> yeah. So she got points there and then she just hung back until the very end and then the very very end and when that first dog stuck its nose down the you know down into the den she would run over there muscle it out of the way and start and just went insane yeah and i asked and i went and talked i I looked into this dog it is the most accomplished competition foxhound in norwegian history yep no kidding that dog has been bred more than any other dog I, I, I have found so far, at least within that breed. And um, you, you, you could not pay me enough. <laughs> Bear's making friends right now. <laughs> I'm making friends right now. I'm going to be, uh, if this is my last podcast, if I'm shot in the back, avenge me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a different hey. world. You know, I'm, I haven't been exposed to many of the pen hunters. Uh, you know, so from an outsider looking in, you know, I just logically think of the differences as far as a, a animal in a pen. I want to talk to somebody who does it because I would assume they run different. Like they know where the boundaries are. They're going to do different things. And 
if they're in the wide open. Right. Um, yeah, I, you'll find that. And, the, the, and those pins, they have to have uh, hidey holes for the varmints to go in. And those mm -hmm. varmints that are run, they learn how to trade off. You know, when when the dogs are running me and I'm a coyote and I'm getting a little winded, I know to go find one of my buddies and go past him, then duck in a hole and let him take the pack for a while. And right. they do that. Hello, those coyotes, they get real smart at it. But, you know, you used the word bear that ruins hounds, and it's called competition. Yeah. We, we, have, we just described competition fox hounds. Yeah. It ruined coon dogs. There's a big difference between a competition coon dog and a, a, what I refer to as a meat dog, the the man that goes out uh, once during the week and on weekends and trees coons for pleasure. It's got a real honest, hardworking hound. We see it, uh, you know, the coon dogs, the competition coon dog would be just like you described. That dog that sees somebody's tail wiggles, he barks first and gets first strike. They run through the woods barking, and he sees a likely-looking tree, and he just stops and sits down and goes to tree. And he didn't know if there's a coon up there, if a coon's even been in it. He could tree. Then the judges get there, and they look up. Oh, we can't see him, but he could be, hide, could be hiding in that park up there, so we're going to call it a circle tree. Yeah. Circle that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he he gets he'll get points for it. You know, it just it's a crock that did it in bird dogs, yep. competition bird dogs. Uh, you know, competition ruins everything in my book. The the, the competition that our hounds have <clears throat> is how smart that bobcat is. Yep, uh, that's ahead of him, or that caracal, or that jackal, or that uh, uh, leopard. If Trevor's got his dogs over there, and there's a boy down in, in uh, well, he hunts some down in Paraguay and part of Brazil, uh, Alexander Armstrong. He's got some of these dogs, and, and you know, he's he's trailing at Jaguars and trailing a few Jaguars, uh, catches more Pumas. They've got a problem in, in certain parts of South America where the Puma are about line. He's a whole lot smaller than our lines, but. The same cat, yeah. where they do a lot of stock damage, and uh, and they're using these kind of hounds down there, but you know, real successful with it. That's interesting. And that was Alexander Armstrong. Yeah, that's his. You know, and I could be telling you just backwards. He might be Armstrong Alexander. He's got the last names of two of the South Texas families, King Ranch families. And he called me one time from the Houston airport, was heading back down to South America and wanted some dogs, wanted to buy dogs. We don't sell dogs. But uh, anyway, we stayed in contact over the Internet, and uh, I sent him a pair of puppies, and uh, he's been raising some dogs, you know, down there. But he, he's down in – he knows old Rocky McBride, uh, you know, there's somebody good you need to get on the podcast if you ever can gather him. Uh, Rocky McBride's down in Paraguay. Yeah, he, they are Alpine, Texas. His daddy's as good a hound man as ever been, and they've got a strain of running walker dogs. He's been breeding 60 years as long as we have these dogs that are probably the best lion dogs in the world. You don't ever hear about him, but they catch lots of lions. They do lots of government work. And anyway, good people, good people to get. If you can ever get them, get Rocky or his brother uh, on a podcast, it would everybody tune in to listen. Great. Thank you for that one. I'll, uh, Rocky McBride, I've written it down with a, with a star next to the name. So I'm going to uh, see if I can track him down. So. What, what's crazy to me is the fact that, you know, everybody wants to talk about taking dogs to different parts of the country and acclimating dogs, you know, and I, I 100% believe that. You know, if I were to drag my dogs out your way, they'd have to acclimate. And I don't know what they'd do. But the fact that <coughs> your dogs are consistently producing top hounds on several continents to me is just mind-blowing. Yeah. You know, regardless of game, regardless of terrain, 
to me, that, that says something right there. Well, it's just a testament to my daddy. You know, he, he had certain, and you've probably seen the, the, the charts that we use when we rate the hounds, we rate them when they're yearling and we rate them every year until they're dead. And, uh, we have five things we rate them for. And that's the things he bred for, you know, it, they got to have brains. If they don't have brains, if they're not smart, none of the rest of the attributes are worth a darn. And then uh, behind brains, they've got to have a good running gear. Don't care how good one's nose is or how good his brains are. If those legs not going to get him there and hold up while he's, while he's working, it doesn't do any good. So that was kind of his order was, uh, Brains, skeleton, nose, and, uh, you know, everybody goes, well, what about their mouth and what about their color? Daddy didn't care if they sounded like a chi bird barking as long as they barked in the right place. <laughs> and right. color, color don't matter. You know, uh, the hounds, my daddy's hounds right now, if you go to, there's four packs here in the States of them. You'll see red and white spotted. You'll see a few lemon spotted. Mostly you're going to see red ringneck dogs. But it, Which are beautiful. Mm, that, that's what always it, stood out to me was those red dogs. Yeah. Well, it just depends on who is the, uh, who are the special dogs of that generation as who gets mated. You know, that's why the red and whites came on, on board because uh, we, we ended up with that was the special hounds and, and they, they got to propagate the line, but then we had some recessors crop up with some tri-colored Harold Parker had a tri-colored bitch. Uh, the only tri-colored in the litter, the rest of them were red and ring neck dogs. And she made an outstanding bitch and he's raised lots of puppies out of her old princess. <clears throat> so he's got some different color, more color variation, in his pack, same hounds, whereas Mike Rook has got mostly red and white, red spotted. I've got all red bring necks in my pack, but it just, you know, that's just the way they, where they came. They could all change and in a couple of generations, go back to tricolor. Just we'll have to see who's worthy of breeding in the next go round. Sure. Let's talk a little bit if about sit- your, your pack now. Um, you hunt you hunt a pretty good variety of things with those guys, don't you? Bobcat, lynx, fox, coyotes. No, 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 no. Our, our we're breed specific, bobcat only. You do bobcat. Everything okay. else is gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. E- everything else is off game. Gotcha. Yeah, bobcat hunting down there. You know, most people listening to this probably know, but that is like, it's a whole thing within itself. You know, the bobcat hunters out there, it, Barry, you should go back and listen to those names, you know, Harold Parker. And, you know, I feel like there's a union to her here, Carrie, like get Bookie and, you know, all those guys on here because you guys keep such close tabs on dogs and work so closely together as far as rating dogs and truly judging them to a standard and not letting emotions get involved, which is in my eyes, the hardest thing when it comes to breeding. Um, yes, sir. I love listening because I talk to all you guys at different times and it's great because I get to hear stories back and forth. And it's, it's just really cool how everybody works there together. You know, you were talking about leasing bitches back in the fifties. That, that's something that out here is just lost. You ask somebody to lease a bitch and they look at you cross-eyed, like they got no idea what you're talking about for something that used to be common practice, you know, for guys Correct. working together for a common goal. Now it's just like ego driven or, or, or ignorance, and I mean that in the nicest way. They just don't even know that that's an option. Where I know I've approached right. it, like, hey, I'll, I'll lease the bitch. Let's have a litter, you know? And you get to keep your dog. You don't have to sell it to me. Right. Well, it was a, a real good way to spread good genetics and give somebody the option. Of, Look, raising a litter of puppies is expensive. And not everybody's in a, in a position to do that every year. So leasing a good bitch, and especially, you know, she comes in twice a year, 
most people are only hunting a certain number of months a year. You could lease a bitch in the off season. Somebody raises litter of puppies, and you have her back in time to hunt her all winter. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of a win-win. Yeah, it would. It would be. Yep. Huh. Yep, sure would be. No, that's a good way to to improve and make good hounds. Share good hounds. Yep. 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 Oh, that's that's interesting, man. Because it, it it is something that it, it almost seems to me like, and I don't know whether it started because before social media or whether it's kind of become a thing because of social media. I think in the dog mushing world, at least, it started a little bit before that people got real protective of their lines and 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 sort of past the point that I think anyway kind of was productive or, or, or kind of made any, any sense where they, they, people stopped doing these kind of making these agreements. Like you were talking about Jason, like you get, like you guys talked yeah. about where, you know, you'd lease a female, you would go and pay a, comp- you know, a competitor, a stud fee to breed to that dog, you know, that they, they would, um, they they got real prickly about it. So you know, I I know just recently, last ten years or so, one of um, one of the best I did a rod dog mushers. The first race that he won, the entire front end of his team he had bought from another competitive dog musher, but he refused yeah. to admit that. And I mean, we, <laughs> we knew the dogs. I knew I knew that it was Beetle running up there. Mm-hmm. I knew that dog well, but he would, I mean, he was, he would be damned before he admitted that he had bought that dog. Which is so weird to me. Yeah. Ego, uh, has created lots of problems. And I tell you, you know, as I mentioned earlier, raising a litter of puppies gotten expensive and what my dad found and saw, you know, from the 1950s, 60s there were lots of really good hunters around Mm. and then as things got easier and better in the country a lot of people quit hunting and you got fewer hunters therefore you had fewer good dogs and the people that were good hunters that had the good dogs they got real stingy and my daddy was the world's worst jason's met him he knew him you know daddy never sold a dog and and i would never sell a dog we do not sell dogs. And uh, now he would give you one, and it was yours to use as long as you want it. When you didn't want it anymore, either give it back to him or kill it. Yep. You know, he, uh, you know, he just, and he would, he was probably doing somersaults in his grave when I, because Richard and them and old Roy Sparks was the first one to contact me about the hounds. Oh, two years before Daddy died. And uh, I said, Daddy, they'd like to try a couple of her dogs down there. I ain't sending no dogs to South America or South Africa. And uh, when when Daddy was gone, I had I had some puppies. Of course, Jason will tell you, we went through lots of issues with people trying to steal Daddy's dogs. And hmm. my Daddy died, died of Alzheimer's. And, uh, you know, he wasn't capable of making good decisions the last Six months he was alive, and he made some boo-boos. We had took us a lot of money to get corrected. But anyway, I had two puppies that we weren't going to be able to hunt. I didn't have any old dogs to start them with. And I told Richard and Trevor, I said, let me send you these two dogs. They're half-brothers and sisters. But now you can take them and, and make them, made them together, and you will not mess up. And, and they'll help you, I think. Well, they got those down there. We gave them. They paid for the freight, and they were so far better than anything they had. Anyway, they they wanted more, and I said, I'm just not going to sell you any, but I'll give you some. And so I ended up, we we gave them them some more, sent some more down there. But but that's the thing. Most people, they just, they're having to spend the money and breed them, and they're not getting any help. They just, they don't want to share them. And. They're ego driven. They don't want to say, well, you know, Jason Doobie started this line of dogs 50 years ago. And, you know, I wouldn't have any if it wasn't for Jason. And, uh, 
you know, you mentioned a while ago, those dogs over in your part of the world, Bear, go back to our dogs. They really don't. They go back to Mr. Hinkle Schilling's dogs. Hinkle the, was the genius behind the hound breeding. <clears throat> My daddy was, was just smart enough to, if the wheel ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know, that's, but this, there's a lot to be said for that. You know, I, everybody wants to be, everybody wants to be an individual. Everybody wants to be unique. And especially, you know, today where you post all these things on, you know, Instagram and uh, TikTok or, or whatever, whatever the kids are using these days. You know, <laughs> you sound old, Bear. I know I sound old. The Tic Tac. The, the, the old tic tac yeah no it's you, you get this impression that there are people that you know and, and i've done the same thing when i got into hounds over here i you know i i started looking into who had the good hounds and one of the places i looked was facebook one of the places i looked was instagram and i went and hunted with some people who according to those medias had mm. hounds and found that they a couple of them overrepresent uh, yeah overrepresented in a lot right. of ways. Yeah. But, you know, I started looking a little closer and, you know, the, the 50 foxes they took last year, that, they looked a little bit too similar to each other, those pictures. Like <laughs> number 25 and 28 looked off. Just recycle them. <laughs> and, you know, but there's, there's something we said for preserving, and, and that's, I, I want to clarify what I was saying earlier, is I'm not talking about preserving a line. I, there is absolutely value in preserving a good line of dogs like your father did preserving, you know, with, with Hinkle Schilling's dogs and like you've done preserving, you know, and uh, like, like you said, if the wheels broke, don't fix it. What I, what I was talking about was, was the people who would come in, find a way to get a dog from you and within a generation, it's theirs call it their own dog you know i would within a generation yeah. i'd be like this is a siragusa hound right here and if you looked yeah. half a second into it you would realize that i'm standing on the shoulders and taking credit for a hundred years worth of work mm -hmm. done by somebody else but you know like is it i'll give you a first-hand experience as an insider i was in a lot of ways that guy when i started because we were so we're so bombarded with information, I think, like social media and seeing this. And, you know, I got it. Dogs. And I was going to make a name for myself. It was ego driven. and It didn't happen until later on. And I started surrounding myself with people that held the dog's value a lot differently than their own. You know, the dog was the valuable part of the equation. They were just the vessel to get that dog to the woods and to accommodate these breedings. But it's not, it's not an ego-driven base with a lot of the very serious breeders. Mm -hmm. um, at least the ones that have the right intention. They're, there's the ones that are focused on winning, selling dogs, making good photos. But, you know, looking back, you think, shoot, when I bred to Brett Williams stuff with the Blue Dogs, that was a lot, a lot of effort going in. Mm -hmm. You know, and he was researching and he's worked so hard on that line. Yeah, they were plum tree and dogs because I felt like I was making the breeding decisions, but I would always try to give credit back to that. You know, it was the breeders that come before, if they set a good foundation, it's your job to not weaken it. Yeah. If you're going to breed yep. it, you can ruin a hundred years of breeding in literally one generation. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. That's the scary thing about it, isn't it? It's like, and you don't know it when you're in it, you know, like the, the new people coming in, it's, uh, it's interesting to see there's been a shift, I think, where there is a lot more value put on the dog where for a time being there, I would say early 2000 or, you know, like 2000, 2010, mm -hmm. when, I guess it was 2010 when I started. It was, uh, there was a lot more pride hung on a dog Yep. than being, I guess, pride and, and being proud of something are a little different. I'm very proud of my hands. They do a good mm -hmm. job. They do what I want them to do. But for me to hang my hat on that, I'm just a taxi driver. That's all it is. 
right? Yeah, I mean, we're we're just the jockeys, right? <laughs> we're the transport truck. Really? That, I mean, exactly. That's right. Yep. Uh, yep. And uh, you know, we're just the uh, as good houndsmen most of the time, and it's the hardest thing to do is get out of the damn hound's way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the best houndsmen I know do very little. They did their work, uh, breeding them, raising them, and um, uh, teaching them right from wrong. Then just get out of their way. Let, let them express their genetic potential. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And, and J- Jason has heard me say this pretty much every podcast I think we've done <laughs> where I, I have a, I have a younger hound. He's, he's about, he's a little over two years old now, but he, I saw really early on that this dog knew more than I did. Yeah. That's usually the case with the good ones. It <laughs> They're is. better and than us. My, my only strength as a trainer, the only thing I did that I can look back on now and be like, that was the right call was to just shut my mouth, take a step back and let that dog do its thing. Mm-hmm. That's and all that foundation really work. work. Yeah. I mean, we're working off hundreds of years of breeding, you know, and it's, there's a reason they made it this far. I hate to think that we are going to be the downfall of those top quality hounds. It's going to take guys looking forward and looking back you have to look both directions if you just want to forget about the past and move on and make a name you set yourself up i think where if you're knowledgeable of what's behind them it really helps you make decisions going forward that are in the best interest of the breed Mm -hmm. versus the best interest of a personal pack and i don't know if that makes any sense to you guys or anybody listening but it makes sense to me yep yeah, very much so. Yes, sir. So that's my two cents on it. I'll make friends too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and something that people have to get around is, you know, the dog, if the three of us were hunting the same varmint in the same country, there's going to be a dog that Jason's going to have that he really likes and does just does everything the way Jason likes it. But Barry, you and me may not like him at all. Right. But right. you know what? The only person that dog has to satisfy is a man that's buying his dog food. Right. And, story. You know, last good Lord made chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla blondes, <laughs> brunettes, and redheads. That's because each of us likes something different. And something different does not mean it's wrong. It's just different. Mm-hmm. Yep. That the, at the end of the day, though, it's how many coon skins are hanging up in the barn, how many little goats and sheep got saved in South Africa, mm-hmm. or how many bobcats uh, are hanging up in our shed or hanging up in the Brahman shed. You know, uh, that's what tells whether what we liked was good or bad right mm-hmm. you know not how we feel about old sport you know that we love him to death because of whatever reason yeah but but what he's produced now there was a competition what did he produce yeah and maybe all you cared about was a trophy you know that's not saying that's bad either to have a competition dog that that all you wanted was a trophy uh, you know, that's fine, but you know, that's, that wasn't what my end game was, and, but that's right. okay. That's what you wanted. So that's okay. Yeah. People are different, man. You know, I, I think the big battle today in Houndsman, just from the 30,000 foot view is if you don't know what you want, it is extremely hard to get a dog to please you. You know, yep. we all think you catch game or you like a dog that strikes or you like a dog that does this. But if you really don't know, I spent a lot of years in that limbo. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to do what my friends were doing or I wanted to do what was, in my eyes, easier, you know, different game 
it, it required different skills and different attributes from the dogs. But to me, it's just, uh, it's really interesting how many people, they just don't know. Like they'll get rid of a dog before, let's say before it reaches its potential, but yet they don't have a gauge of what is going to make that dog a keeper or breed worthy. It, it just comes back on emotions a lot more, I think now. Right. What, what is our good friend that it, up above you, Mr. Dewey Walton, you say, you know, that they just weren't smart, smart enough to know what they didn't know. And right. You know, uh, they might've had the dog that they really wanted. Uh, they just didn't know how to get him there. They didn't know. It. Well, I'd say two of my yeah. top hounds right now. I mean, I got both of them at about, I'm going to say 10 months <laughs> old. And just to be a testament to everybody has different expectations. I can tell you, you couldn't buy either one of them. You know, I yep. picked them up at 10 months old and took them to the woods and they did everything that I liked. And, uh, you know, it's what's good for the goose isn't always good for the gander. And I think that's a really important thing for houndsmen to, to remember. Yep. When you're making those selections, block out all the noise, turn off the social media, you know, talk to a few people that you really confide in and that you respect in this hound world or the bird dog world or the sled dog world, you know, and, and really work together and, and bounce things off of each other, but know what you want. If there's no end goal, you're never going to make it. You're just going to have a lot of turmoil along the way with some speckled in good dogs, some speckled in coals, but know, know the direction you're going. I think the biggest problem that we all face. A hundred percent. I totally agree. Yep. Yeah, and you know, it sure don't hurt to take a little bit of time and sit down and put your thoughts and your, put it down in writing, you know, yep. and revisit plan your work, work your plan. That's right. Keep going back and add things to it. You know, one of the greatest things that I have is a, is a little, actually, I've got four of them, I think now, a little hunting log. We logged every time we went. And then daddy told me, said, anytime you get a thought, you write it down in there and then ask me and I'll tell you what I think. But, uh, but, but, uh, kept a record of the hunt, kept a record of the, of the dogs and, uh, and, and just use it as a roadmap, yeah. using it as a roadmap. Right. Yeah. And I think going forward, that's the important part. Did your daddy keep a, a journal or a dog log? Oh yeah. Yeah, Do you still one. have those? Yeah, yeah, I've got those. Yeah, and I've got four that we've started in, you know, 03, 04, I guess 03 when I started hunting. Uh, you know, that that, that I feel. Uh, but, yeah, he had a – he's got one where he kept – he and the gentleman that hunted with him in Texas all through the 60s and 70s, they kept records. And, uh, over, and, and I've written about it, the game houndsman, several thousand, 10 years and many thousands of bobcats, you know, the, where he caught it time and date, uh, what the cat had in his belly, how the cat ran, you know, the sex, all those kind of things. Uh, you know, if, if a dog. Uh, a certain dog performed outstanding. Not all the entries have a hound note, but most of them do. Some of them do, probably rather than most of them. Some of them do. Uh, and, you know, that's that's a very valuable tool. I mean, it's very sentimental, sentimentally valuable to me, but it's a valuable tool to go back to to read. And uh, I know I use the sure. tools, uh, the books that, we use to, to gauge where the best places to go to find a varmint are. You know, we, uh, we, we know what, what road and what covert we would tend to find cats on. And that'd be the places we want to go back to hunt. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, keeping records is, uh, is a smart thing to do. Yeah. Mm hmm a hundred percent. People say that hindsight is 2020. I've actually found that to not be true at all. 
I can't, uh, I can't remember. I can't remember half of what I did last year that worked. And I can't remember <laughs> half of what I did last year that didn't work. You know, if I don't write it down, I have to write it down or I'm not going to remember what it is. Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really good way to also, you know, you can go into it, as you say, go into it with an idea of what you want. And then, you know, writing it down as you can kind of see the progression and it, it really helps to, to fine tune and clarify what you're, what you're going to, what you're going for from, from season to season, from breeding to breeding, from dog to dog. That's yes, the sir. big one, I think, is overall the generations when you track things like that. And you can compare offspring in a chronological order compared to like their parents. Mm -hmm. You know, looking back and seeing where's the consistency? Is it in the structural build? Is it in the traits? Is it in start times? Um, you know, when is that puppy starting to track? When is it really truly not just me too? And if it ever does, I mean, some of them are just do it all right out of the womb but i think i think you're right yeah i i'm big on encouraging people to keep records on their hounds and uh from the time they're puppies you know uh you know we're blessed bailey my daughter uh raising puppies since you know the early 2000s and you know little things like coming and saying hey you know daddy they're just opening their eyes and this little puppy here this one's sure more aggressive. Uh, you know, she's the one that's always wandering off and getting lost. We're having to fight. Just keeping those kind of little notes and then seeing if that translates, you know, into a little more independence when they're uh, starting to hunt, uh, mm -hmm. where they might reach out a little further to try to find the game. Uh, you know, it's been amazing seeing the, the corollaries that develop, and, and you can – you can track lots of things from an early age uh, if you just take the time to to notice it and then document it and log it. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's been an interesting trip. Been an interesting trip. I'd like to see your. You said you've got a chart that you guys scale them off of, right? Yeah, Tom? I would also like to see that. Yep. Because <laughs> it sounds like I mean, like Bears talked to a lot of the guys over his way. You know, the European standard of a working dog is so different, I think, than in the U.S. I think the, the root of it is we all kind of look for a lot of the same stuff. But, man, their breeding programs over your way bear and working together, it's insane. I, I think of it a lot like, you know, John and his friends, and yeah. even me and my buddies. Um, you get in that tight-knit group where you can really be honest and not take offense when somebody knocks your dog. Yeah. I'm sorry, my dogs need to knock sometimes. You know, they, they lack here or they do this really well or you've got to be open and not take a personal offense to what an independently thinking and acting creature is doing. Yeah, correct. it's a hundred percent. You know, there's, there's, and I, you know, I've, I've not been in the hounds long enough to experience it as much with the hounds, but definitely with the sled dogs too, you know, is sometimes having an experienced eye come in and be like, eh, you know what? you've got some good stuff here, but they're missing this. Yep. Fresh eyes, find holes, man. That's what I think of, you know, and, and the, what makes, what makes the hound hunting over here really interesting is that, you know, you, we, we don't hunt in packs. We're not, we're not even allowed to hunt in packs. We are only allowed to let one hound hit the ground per animal per hunter. See, and you, I would think you guys have a lot harder time finding that dog then, you know, like, let's say me, I can take four dogs out, fill four different holes and have a complete pack, quote, right. unquote, where you've got to have a dog that's going to, you have to excel in every area. I think the standard is really high when you hit, like where you have legal restrictions or guys like John or other breeders that are really holding to a standard. Right. They're not all going to make it, you know, right. even if they're great dogs does not mean it's breed worthy in my eyes as a personal opinion. I agree with that. And I, I think that, it, you know, in some ways I chafe under the, some of the rules over here, you know, it, it irritates me that I, I need to do all the legwork myself when I'm training a pup. I, I can't let that pup, you know, learn off of a dog that is good at what I want it to do. 
I've got to teach that pup everything myself. But on the flip side, it does hold us to a higher standard in some ways. You know, the, the, I'm not saying that the dogs over here are, are, are better than the dogs that are over there. I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, Us either. But, you want to start a turf war? No, no, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go down that road. You know, my two of, or yeah, I mean, hell, all three of my dogs go back to within two, three generations. Go back to dogs that came from there. Mm-hmm. You know, so it would be foolish of me to make a claim like that. But when we are when we are talking about doing breedings, um, we have to. Th- there's this you have to keep it in the back of your mind that what we're breeding for is that, is that Rambo, that one man army, because that's what we need. You know, I, I don't have the luxury of like I had with the sled dogs where I could take 18 individuals or 16 individuals and sort of meld them into a, a working unit filling, you know, each dog taking its, you know, playing, playing dog strengths. When I put a dog on the ground, that dog is going to need to do everything on its own. And I can mitigate that a little bit by when I choose to put it on the ground, how far into a, you know, how I choose to go about it. But still, ultimately that dog from the moment its feet hits the ground until that, until it either, you know, we either have a loss or we've got something in a tree or in an underground, that dog is going to need to function completely on its own. I think the accountability is higher. Like you, I'm a big fan in taking a step back. I don't do a lot of training. I don't do scent drags with dogs anymore. I don't work on trees, period. Uh, I rely on the natural ability at this point. Right. Where it really does fall a lot on your shoulders when you have to hopefully find a prospect that fills all those holes and not screw it up. I mean, would you agree, Bear? I mean, you're not going to teach it anything it doesn't know. You got to do, like you said, and know when to take a step back. A hundred percent. Let it go. 100%. Where John and I can go kick a pup loose with a pack of dogs, and I mean, the amount that they learn their first week in the woods is huge. You know, the the sure. learning curve is so much faster. I think. Right, and you know, you can you can definitely set up a dog in training. You can set a dog up for success so that it figures out how to do something that you want it to do, Mm -hmm. but it takes, you got, you you got to be so deliberate about it. And then I, you know, then when you're talking, when you're looking at it, you know, like the, there was a, there was a major mange epidemic that went through the fox population over here in the eighties and wiped out 90% of the foxes. So there were very few foxes left in Norway. Now we're back up to the same level and actually even a, a bigger population than we were in the 80s when the population collapsed because of, uh, because of mange. Um, but in the meantime, what happened was that people started breeding for hare hounds. They bred their fox dogs and, and, and they bred to individuals that were good at hunting hares and stopped focusing on the qualities that made a good fox dog. See, so, yeah, that circles back to kind of what I would say. Right. You, know, you, you morph your hunting to your surroundings and the opportunity. Exactly. So mm-hmm. when people started getting back into the fox hunting, and there's not a lot of us, but there's some of us, there wasn't a whole lot to get here anymore. So that's why you see a lot of people going back, you know, ha- having gone outside of Norway and gone and gotten, you know, what, what they consider to be, to be, you know, good good dogs and some you know some of them are and 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 or some of them aren't you know but then you've got some dogs when you start to get get into it a little bit the established fox hunting lines over here i don't think it's a coincidence that they all go back to mr clay's dogs Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying is it it, it's like a good a good quality breeding program is going to produce a good quality hound whether you're doing the doing it in the big pack seven packs a day like they're doing it over in africa or whether you're doing it with a single dog you and a single dog hitting the hills together i, I think regardless it, the quality of the breeding program and the honesty that that breeder has about the quality of those dogs is is it's the thing that the that the breeding in the united states and breeding over here ha, it, it has in common is that um you need to be honest about what you've got and mm-hmm. you're still not going to be able to recreate 
it's, it's going to be a lot more effort to recreate something than to just rather than going with an established performing Ram. dogs. Yeah. When you, if you put the right genetics in them, you know, really all you need to do as a dog trainer is teach that dog to mind. Come here. And put then, an animal on it. And, and then know where to take it to where the varmints are going to frequent and then get out of the way and let it live up to its genetic potential. Now, it will have a learning curve to learn the skills that uh, that it probably, I mean, it's in its DNA. It just has to perfect them. And that's, you know, a function of time. Uh, and the smarter they are, the less time it takes for them to get where it can single-handedly uh bring a varmint to tree or to, to bay. Uh, but if, it, if the genetics are there, you know, it, they're going to come through. Yeah. I suggest people back up right now and listen to that statement again. 100%. Because I feel that a lot of people, you know, we all go hunting. We expect to go find a bear or a cat or a fox or whatever. We're waiting for those dogs to find it. When you're looking at building a dog and you're starting with a, a younger or inexperienced town, I don't think the magnitude of responsibility that's put on the dog handler is, is acknowledged. It is your job to go find that game to put them on. If you're taking a dog out expecting it just to know and find it, I think you can put yourself backwards quite a few steps. But like John just said, know your game, put them in an area where there's exposure. That is, that is where the, the, uh, the responsibility falls on all of us town and you will definitely start seeing increased you know learning curves they start learning faster because it's constant exposure i i think that's something that people really need to to focus on is put them where they can succeed it is fully on you as a handler to set that dog up for success or for failure now despite the breeding behind it they may they may become awesome dogs despite you. Right. But you've got to know the game you're chasing as well as your dog, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, if you put a polar bear dog on, uh, if you bring a polar bear dog down to Texas and expect it to hunt polar bears, you're going to be in, uh, you're going to be bumming pretty hard, I think. Right. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, we have, uh, we are up over about an hour and 45 minutes here, Mr. Clay. And I, uh, I think I'll let you uh, let Jason get back to work and I'll let you get on with your day. But this was, uh, I appreciate well, I appreciate it you coming on here. I appreciate it. Anytime we can help you, we're glad to, uh, you and I'll stay in contact and, uh, yeah, well, Jason, you go get, get you some diapers folded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're waiting. I don't know when this will air, but we're, we're any day now. Well, I got to quit cranking these kids out so we can get down there to Texas. Y'all come on, and then at some point in time, maybe next spring, when the airplane tickets get cheap, we'll uh, we'll go down and spend some time with Richard. There you go. That would be great. Well, it was good catching up with Perfect. you guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Mr. Clay. All right. Bye bye. 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 Man, I love that sound. <laughs>